Good afternoon everyone and welcome to this afternoon's WorkSafe Month webinar, Work-Related Alcohol and Drug Use, a Fit for Work Issue. I'm Stephanie from WorkSafe Tasmania and also the coordinator of WorkSafe Tasmania Month. I'll also be your moderator for this afternoon's session. Before we do get started, there are just a few uh, Sorry, before we do get started, I'd appreciate you taking a few moments to uh, read the following information about uh, uh, sessions during, delivered during WorkSafe Month. I'll now run over how you can interact in this afternoon's webinar. So we've taken a screenshot of the control panel of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer screen in the upper right corner. You're likely listening in using your computer's system, speaker system I should say by default. Uh, however, if you would prefer to join by phone, um, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dialing information will be displayed. You'll also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing in your questions in the pane of the control panel. You can send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We will collect them and address them uh, during the presentation and also at the end. We are also recording today's webinars and webinars that we are running during WorkSafe Month. Um, they will be, be progressively made available on the WorkSafe TAS website, so do have a look there after WorkSafe Month. And also lastly, but uh, not least, uh, when you do leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey of the presentation and we'd appreciate uh, you providing us with your feedback and your comments before you do leave. Now to today's presenter. Um, the program of events does state that we were, were meant to have Oliver Fearman from IPM Safety. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, Oliver is not with us today. Instead, we have Gary Lebsent uh, from IPM Safety. So I welcome Gary this afternoon to present uh, today's webinar, Work-Related Alcohol and Drug Use, a Fit for Work Issue. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Steph, and um, good afternoon, everyone out there. I see we've got 21 people logged in, so that's a, a goodly number. And yes, my apologies for those of you who are expecting to uh, hear from Oliver. Um, he wasn't available today. He's he's actually um, at a training course himself. Um, those of us at IPM, we we uh, pride ourselves in keeping up, uh, keeping abreast of latest information in the work health and safety arena. So. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've spent uh, 30 odd years in, in heavy industry and um, over that time I've, I've been in various situations uh, associated with drugs and alcohol, not too many, uh, thank goodness. Um, I can remember a, a situation where I had to call out a, an electrician um, one um, on the weekend sometime to fix a, a piece of plant and he said, Gary, well, I, I, I'm I certainly I can come in, but I won't. I can't drive. I've, uh, I've been drinking a bit too much. So that was one interesting circumstance. I had another person who worked for me. Um, uh, after a while, um, I sort of found out he was on a, a rehab program, and uh, I think the union official and and I think the works uh, HR officer had got together and uh, suggested the guy talk to me and uh, then work out what what we're going to do going into the future. Um, and the other other aspects are, um, are the uh, the breath testing that um, I've experienced sort of going onto mine sites, uh, especially here in Tasmania. Anyway, just a little bit about a little bit about my background. So, um, work-related alcohol and drug use. Um, so, as you can see on the screen here, these are the the main topics today. What what is fit for work? I'll uh, go over that and then describe. Um, give a definition for it. Uh, fit for work, uh, shared responsibility. It's um, yeah, quite a few people involved, and then the fit for work and the interaction interaction with uh, responsibilities under the law, under the Tasmanian law, and then cover the 
the effects of alcohol and drugs, and then the key principles of effective drug and alcohol risk management and uh, programs that uh, companies have these days. So fit for work. So the so the term fitness for work, um, as the word say it you know effectively means that a person is fit um, physically and uh, psychologically uh, to enable them to perform their normal work tasks uh, competently in a in a safe manner um, which does not threaten their safety or health or well-being or indeed that of others so hence that's the that's the uh, the crux of the matter and um, how drugs and alcohol can can affect a, a person's fitness for work so a shared responsibility is you obviously the worker, so the, the person who's um, uh, theoretically affected in, uh, in this discussion. So obviously there's, um, he ha uh, will get into uh, his or her duty of care in, in a little while. But fellow workers, uh, they may well notice a difference in, in the worker's um, attributes. And um, so they have a responsibility to to either speak up or uh, aim to help him or her or uh, mention it to the supervisor and I guess this is where, where teamwork comes into it. Obviously the supervisor, so the supervisor has responsibilities both to the worker and to the fellow workers and so they have a, a responsibility to, uh, to communicate with workers, uh, to perhaps um, uh, coach, um, uh, mentor, um, and uh, to, to uh, work with work issues out with the workers and even notice once again notice whether a worker is acting differently from one day to another. So the medical assessor, so the um, the worker may go to a, a a medical person for some for some help, and this is where the uh, it may get um, prescription uh, medication uh, prescribed to them. Um, the, uh, and so the medical assessor has a, has a responsibility of explaining how um, different drugs, different medication can affect a person, all the different side effects. Um, certainly uh, you've probably all had examples of getting medicine and reading the, the blurb that comes with it and there's all sorts of different side effects so uh, that's possible and we're not all the same. Family and friends. So they have responsibility as well, whether they, I guess, perhaps in, encourage a person to, uh, to, to drink or, or take drugs or perhaps a responsibility uh, to, um, uh, to talk them out of it, um, comment on their friends, friends either helping them or supporting them. And certainly there's been ads on, uh, regular ads over the years about, uh, certainly about alcohol and the effect of drink driving. So that's the the, uh, the shared responsibility in this case. So so fit for work. Um, so the the legal uh, ramifications comes in under the the duty of care. So uh, duty of care refers to duties that the legislation places upon people to ensure their own safety at work and of others. And um, as you can you probably know. Employers, employees, supervisors, um, virtually everybody on a work site has, has a particular duty of care under uh, Tasmanian legislation. So this, um, this slide gives some more details. So you've got four, four duties of care. You've got the, the PCBU, which is the, the, um, the legal term for the employer. So the um, so the the employer has the overall duty of care for uh, to for everybody on site uh, so to take reasonably practicable uh, steps uh, to reduce risks and in this case um, to take reasonable practical steps to to check to uh, ensure to help people um, be fit for work effectively um, and. And that sort of leads into the next one, so officers' duty of care. So officers under legislation, uh, they are the senior people within the organisation, the people who have uh, major controls of budgets 
uh, resources, um, setting up systems. So uh, the officers are effectively putting in um, systems, um, setting up leadership um, and and also leading, if you like, teamwork, reinforcing teamwork, uh, culture, that are all important aspects to um, work health and safety generally and in this case uh, being whether people are fit for work. So um, it's called due diligence, so officers have to put systems in place to monitor, to reinforce, to support um, good um, safety systems, safety practices and having a system in place in relation to testing or responding or performance managing is uh, an important uh, part of their, their uh, legal duty of care. Uh, workers' duty of care. So this is uh, termed reasonable care, so all workers on site and the term workers, um, so that covers um, uh, employee, employees as well as contractors, uh, apprentices, even volunteers. Um, so uh, systems need to be in place to induct the workers in the first place, to train them um, so that they are made aware of what uh, the company's expectations of them are. In this case, um, you know, fit for work. Um, they're expected to be to come to work in a, a fit state, and and if not, you know, um, actually acknowledge to their supervisors if they've got a problem. And um, we'll get the next slide has a little bit more details on the the workers and um, others, as they call it, uh, duty of care. Others being uh, visitors and similar people, and they both have, it's called reasonable care in the legislation standard. So yes, yeah, so a duty of care, workers and others, so um, so legally the, this is the requirement, so workers and other people at other at, uh, at workplace, they have to take responsible uh, care, reasonable care of their own health and safety. So, um, determine, you know, being self-aware of their of their fitness for work is where this connection comes in. Uh, they also have to take reasonable care that uh, conduct does not, that their conduct does not adversely affect others in the workplace, um, and also comply as he or she is reasonably able to do so with inst instructions. So, instructions being, you know, policies, uh, procedures. As well as well as verbal instructions from from supervisors and managers, and workers, as opposed to other people, uh, may have to cooperate with reasonable notified policies or procedures, and um, other people in the workplace may not uh, have such ready access to details about a company's policies or procedures, and and hence that's why there's not a connection there between. Um, other persons at the workplace and the duty of care to cooperate with reasonable procedures. So just to, just to summarise that again, so I started off with duty of care being uh, a person's ability to be fit to do their work and this is the, the legal uh, requirements that uh, workers have to follow and ultimately officers, managers uh, and, the, and the employer um, must uh, implement, follow uh, to ensure uh, work health and safety standards are, are, are continued to be met. So the effects of alcohol and drug use, and um, I'm guessing most of you probably have a, a, a pretty good understanding of these, but um, let me just go through a, a few of the details with you. So obviously a, dr a drug is any substance which is taken into the body and alters its function as in the body's function physically and or psychologically. So just a, a few definitions. So illicit drugs. So illicit drugs refers to illegal drugs including heroin, uh, cocaine, barbiturates, cannabis and MDMA. 
Um, so there's quite a range of illegal drugs, as you no doubt know. There's also uh, non-medical use. So illicit drugs also covers non-medical use of pharmaceutical drugs, including painkillers, amphetamines, methadone, other opiates and steroids. And then lastly, the inappropriate use of volatile substances and other substances like ketamines and inhalants. So there's a, quite a, a wide range of what is regarded to be illicit drugs. Another definition, short-term risk drinking. So that's um, generally drinking at risk or high risk levels at least once in, so there's, there's three, three groups. Um, during the last 12 months is defined as occasional. In the last month is defined as infrequent. And in the last week is defined as frequent. Um, when we get into discussing uh, the effects of um, either alcohol or drugs. So workplace alcohol and illicit drug use refers to a wider definition that includes alcohol and or drugs consumed during work hours or immediately before consuming, uh, commencing work. It also includes consumption that occurs outside of normal working hours that may be influenced by workplace culture, norms or expectations that could have an effect on the person's capacity to perform their work. So they're the, um, they're the main definitions that uh, will come up during this afternoon's presentation. So prescription uh, medication, so um, some people may well uh, assume that um, the doctor gives them medications to take for some uh, ailment, whether it be a cold or a flu or, or something else. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there, there can be um, an unexpected impact on their working ability. So uh, I think, uh, once again, these, this may be obvious, but let me cover it. So alcohol is a depressant drug. So it slows down activity in the central nervous system, including the brain. It affects concentration and coordination and slows the response time to unexpected situations, which could lead to risk-taking behaviour, uh, incidents, falls, injury and death as consequences of the brain's reduced control over reaction time. After just one or two drinks, a person may feel more relaxed, but will also have slower reflexes. I think somewhere, somewhere over time I've heard, um, I think they, they link a certain amount of percent of alcohol in, your, in our system is uh, effectively where um, got the reflexes of a 70 year old or an 80 year old. Um, it's one of the ways the, uh, the doctors and the media have tried to get the message across to us. So as the person drinks more, they would continue to experience the acute health effect of alcohol use, which includes various things such as confusion, drowsiness, blurred vision, poor muscle control, gut irritation, diarrhea, and the, and the list goes on. And I guess a lot of us see the, um, I guess, reminded of how long these uh, alcohol stays in our system when the... Um, the breathalyzer tests, particularly on the side of the road, uh, maybe uh, Sunday morning or um, trying to test people whether they're, they're, they're driving after a hard night the night before. So um, effects of illicit drugs, so that, that will depend a lot on the type of drug use. So the most common illicit drugs consumed are cannabis, ecstasy, amphetamines and cocaine. So impaired coordination, affected thinking and memory, increased heart rate and low blood pressure are some of the effects of consuming even small doses of cannabis, for example. So larger quantities can lead to distorted perception, confusion, restlessness, anxiety and panic, uh, decreased reaction time and paranoia. So um, the same amount of drug won't affect us 
affect all of us exactly the same way. So hence, it's a, it can be a little uh, complicated. It's a, it's a not necessarily an easy way of of connecting an amount of drugs to the effect of a person's uh, coordination and decision making. Um, and that's why the, I guess, medical practitioners and doctors have such a big role in um, either the testing program or the monitoring program um, or, the, or the re even the rehab programs. So the, yeah, so as the screen says, certainly we expect people to, you know, be behave be aware of behaviour changes and, and I said this, is, you know, there's a shared responsibility amongst a lot of people, not just workers and, and team members but also supervisors and managers and, and um, always discuss with the doctor is a, is a, a very important um, part of this. So alcohol and other drug use in Australia, so um, these results are, are uh, came out of a, a somewhat recent survey and um, various surveys come out over time. Um, the, exact, the exact numbers are not that important. Um, it's more that, um, you know, it's the uh, relative uh, use or the possibility of use of, in the community. And certainly one community is probably different to another community across Australia. And um, and these numbers are averages right across Australia. So you've got nearly a third of people have used cannabis at some time in their life. 10% um, have used it in the last 12 months. Um, eight, nearly 10% use some sort of form of illicit drug in their life and a similar number during the past 12 months. Um, and then even another um, strangely smaller percent have used prescription drugs for non-medical purposes um, and thankfully only a lesser number have used it during the, the past past 12 months. So let's just um, go into a, a polling question here. Um, have, in, have any incidents happened on your work site in, you, in which it was suspected that workers were affected by drugs? So I'll show those results now, Gary. All right, so <coughs> of our 23 uh, groups of people who've logged in, um, I don't really know how many have actually um, answered the poll, but uh, we've got 69% uh, have no knowledge of any incidents happening on your work site that was suspected to do with drugs, but but there is 31%, so that's a that's a reasonably high number, and I guess hence the I guess the the interest in today's session. So we're just going back to the to the slides. Thanks, Steph. So, yeah, so effects in the workplace. So, so let's just summarise that again. So alcohol and other drug use has potential negative consequences. Uh, nothing new in that statement. Um, drug effects vary depending on the, the individual, the environmental and drug-related factors. Um, problems are not restricted to the relatively small number of dependent users. Um, studies have shown that infrequent and moderate users contribute to a large proportion of alcohol and other drug problems in the workplace. So that's the uh, findings of some recent studies. So let's just move to um, the relevance of alcohol and drug uh, screening in the workplace. 
in the workforce. So um, another study there, 2004, 2005, estimated the uh, a cost of 55 billion uh, in direct and indirect costs to the Australian economy. This is the um, use of alcohol and, or the effects of alcohol and, and, and drug use in the workplace. And they estimate it was a factor of 10% of workplace deaths and 25% of workplace accidents. So quite high numbers, quite high numbers that um, have, have uh, triggered many companies to uh, aim to do something about it um, up to this point in time. So misuse of alcohol and drugs is associated with absenteeism, turnover, decreased output and performance. So, so once again, not, not a, um, an earth shattering statement and um, can be the trigger for other forms of employer liability and litigation. Example, you know, sexual harassment claims, um, people not quite behaving as they should and end up in, um, in court and employer. Uh, uh, so once again, um, uh, just to reinforce, you know, there's, uh, this is the evidence that, um, that companies, offices, as I mentioned before, need to have appropriate systems and, and procedures and, and testing programs in place. So we've, we've started off with the uh, fit for work, fitness for work, um, then leading into the, um, the legal requirements for duty of care for both workers and um, supervisors and managers. Now the key principles of individual organisations drug and alcohol policies. So, um, so, the, so the aims, so the honourable aims is to improve safety, to improve productivity, to reduce uh, defects and problems and to help employees overcome and modify you know, uh, their patterns of use of such substances. Um, now the trick is how how the implementation of such policies can be seen so it's not like just catching people out. So it's a, it's a fine line uh, between the, um, the noble and um, quite correct aims of certainly improving workplace safety and, and helping people go home fit and well at the end of each and every day uh, versus people just thinking it's a, it's, a, it's a way to catch them out. And certainly the um, companies I've seen with, with testing systems, certainly the mining industry, I think as I, I mentioned earlier in my lead in uh, with the, uh, the breath tests um, at the, that uh, everybody has to um, uh, adhere to on entry onto site each, each shift, um, heavy industry and also transportation industries. Now you notice in those three, mining, heavy industry and transportation, so this is where the high risks are. So, um, you know, uh, incorrect decisions, poor decisions by people um, that are affected by drug alcohol can have drastic effects on a large number of other people in these industries. Um, so principles of um, good practice and testing obligations for, for both the companies and testers. So um, it's one thing to have a, a policy in place. Um, generally, uh, testing will be required and principles of good practice here, as you see on your screen, privacy, confidentiality, uh, meeting duties of care, provision of information, fairness, et cetera, et cetera. Now the, um, so just the provision of information. So, so part of that would be actually, you know, just letting workers know um, what drugs are being test for, tested for. Uh, I've mentioned some of these earlier, but um, opiates, um, example, Panadine Fort, which you, uh, all of us can get from the local chemist. So the codeine that's in Panadine Fort, so it's transformed into morphine in the, in the human body. So hence it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the drugs that's opiates that is the general term that they test for, amphetamines. So the, the Sudafed type flu and cold tablets um, uh, fit into the, the description called amphetamines. 
antidepressants, so Xanax. So um, all these uh, medications are uh, easily and um, probably quite widely used across the community. Uh, THC uh, or, or marijuana. Um, THC is the is the specific ingredient in marijuana, but sorry, don't ask me a question about what THC stands for. I'm just I'm, um, I'm told that's just the, it's a, one of these long chemical names. And then the the fifth one is methamphetamines. So this is ice, and we've heard about uh, ice um, recently in the media. Some people using the term uh, being an, an epidemic and um, other people are trying to uh, perhaps suggest it's not that bad, um, but certainly I think most people agree it's increasing. Um, and the tests for such things and the, effect, the effects of, of all these are the, are the, um, the issues that uh, companies, um, and back to that list I had earlier, so all those people who have a shared responsibility are uh, generally having to deal with the effects of uh, illicit drug use, um, perhaps more um, over, um, greater use of um, medical drugs that are prescribed through chemists uh, and some people decide to take so, uh, more than they prescribed and, and then can end up in, with um, uh, poor performance and hence maybe, maybe being tested uh, um, while at work. Um, now this afternoon is certainly all about work, but we we quite often hear about uh, testing for drugs in the uh, in the sporting arena, and it's um, it's a little um, it's 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 quite similar. You know, there's a there needs to be a testing program. It needs to be, um, as this slide says, uh, confidentiality. Uh, provision of information so people know um, what's being tested for, as I said, so fairness, uh, gender and cultural sensitivity and, and certainly communication around, um, I guess, the policy in the first place, uh, the, the, the style of testing. Um, some companies, uh, certainly that I've had um, uh, dealings with, um, have Sometimes they have just ad hoc uh, testing for, for drugs. Um, quite often they'll have a program or a policy that says if there's a, a certain incident, um, whether it be uh, equipment damage or and uh, a work health and safety incident where someone's injured uh, at work, um, there's an automatic uh, test for um, uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, and um, there's not necessarily one uh, type of policy and uh, testing regime that's that's um, uh, required by all companies, but it's almost a a case by case basis. And I I mentioned the um, I guess the industries that I've been that I am aware of that already have such um, testing programs in place as the the, the mining industries, heavy industry, and transportation. So, um, in your industries, if you um, you know take a, a risk-based approach, if you're considering um, you know taking issues to a work health and safety committee, um, discussing maybe management is considering bringing in these policies. Um, so, if you have it on a on a, a risk-based approach, it it makes more sense. What makes it sort of makes more scientific. You've got a basis for it as to what the uh, particular uh, activity is or the potential outcome of um, poor decisions uh, based on people, you know, being affected by by drugs or alcohol. So, a drug and alcohol policy. So. Um, so implementation of a structured drug and alcohol program within the organisation and continued monitoring of the policy. So these are the, the details that need to be in the policy. Consequences of um, non-negative results. 
So um, non-negative is a, I guess it's a, a scientific term that they they don't use the word positive because sometimes they, they um, uh, the results, uh, I guess they need to protect themselves um, as to whether it's um, uh, the, the drug is absolutely detected and hence they end up with terms called non-negative and um, or instead of positive results. And certainly um, uh, policies I've seen is that you, um, it, it's not as if one strike and you're out so to speak, it's um, to attempt to try to help employees, it's a case of you know having tests available for them um, at the entrance to a work site, so um, it help them make a decision whether they should be at work or not. Um, but even when they're found out for the first time, it can be a trigger to get them into a program um, to actually help them overcome it. So that's the, the uh, you know the policy needs to have details of the consequences and the uh, and the process between uh, I guess testing and um, rehabilitation and and um, coming back to work. So education of the effects and long-term usage of drugs and uh, drugs and abuse. So uh, another thing that um, it's not just the testing, but it's education uh, needs to be a part of the a company's policy, um, you know, to help employees uh, and w workers generally un understand what what can happen, uh, both affecting to them when they if they're affected by the drugs or even if they if they're tested and found to be non-negative. Ongoing reinforcement of the organisation's drug and alcohol policy, so that that needs to be spelt out. And then most companies have an employee assistance program, where um, a a, a counselling type uh, company uh, uh, provides a service for the uh, the workers um, for 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 companies. So if they feel that they've um, this is not just for drug, drug and alcohol issues, they have the employee assistance program generally has a number of free sessions for uh, workers to take advantage of and they can get an independent person and talk to them confidentially about um, issues, whether it's family issues or, or, or whatever it is that, that may be affecting them um, when they go to work. Okay, so under an organisation's drug testing policy, so um, usually anyone within the organisation can be tested, and certainly um, in some organisations I've I've uh, worked in, there've been managers that have gone out of their way to put up their hand when they've been involved in some incidents and uh, and and sort of lead the way of going and, and being tested. Um, so those working in dangerous, at-risk industries or operating equipment and machinery are often subject to random workplace testing. And so um, there it is again, the dangerous and at-risk industries operating equipment and machinery, uh, where the link is that you know, the consequences of poor decisions um, can be quite, uh, quite horrific. And um, uh, causal testing, so that's what I described before, uh, if there's an, inc in, an incident of, um, and I guess this is where the company's policy needs to determine what type of incident uh, requires uh, the person or the people involved um, to be sent immediately for, for, for drug or hold testing. So the, so the, so the key messages, um, if I can go over those again for you, so so studies have shown that that people in the workforce are more likely to have consumed alcohol or illicit drugs in the past 12 months than people who are not in the workforce. I guess um, the explanation behind that is that um, I guess people who are in the workforce are earning more money and have more um, more spare cash, so to speak, uh, available to to actually purchase the the alcohol and, and the drugs in the first place. Also, contrary to popular opinion, the greater cost to employers 
do not arise through the behaviour and habits of alcohol and drug dependent workers, but through the greater number of moderate drinkers when they occasionally or infrequently drink to excess or infrequently use illicit drugs. So the, the impairment that comes from both acute and chronic symptoms of alcohol and, and illicit drug use can lead to occupational health and safety issues for both workers who consume these products and other people that they work with. Now considering the length of time that people spend at work, the workplace is ideally situated to change attitudes and behaviour in regards to alcohol and other dr drug use. And I guess some people will be thinking, gee, we've, we're, we're, uh, we've got so many things that we've got to um, educate our, our workers on. And I guess that's, um, it's almost a fact of life currently uh, in Australia where um, I guess we're trying to improve uh, people's uh, work habits in, in lot of, lots of areas and certainly alcohol and drug use is just one of those. So lastly, in, in, in terms of key messages, a, a workplace policy on alcohol and drug use should be developed in consultation with all members of the workplace, apply equally to all levels, clearly state what is acceptable behaviour and clearly state the consequences of any unacceptable behaviour and be clearly communicated to all members of the workforce. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, that's, a, that's a, a summary of the, um, I guess, key messages. So let's go to another polling question. Um, does your company have an alcohol drug testing policy or procedure? So I'll close that poll, Gary, and share the results. Alrighty, so we've got 6% um, of people say that your company has a alcohol and drugs testing policy, um, but it's not effective. Um, about a third people say that there is a policy and it is effective. But a very big number, 61%, feel that there's um, uh, you just don't have an alcohol and drugs testing policy and procedure. So um, uh, certainly there's uh, would appear to be some work work to be done in in those uh, companies. Steph, has there been any questions come in? Yes. Yeah, so the first question is new probably already covered this, but um, I guess it probably comes to whether a person can refuse um, an alcohol and, uh, and and drug test and also what right does, I guess, the person in charge have to ask um, for an alcohol and drug test? Yes, and I guess um, I guess the, the answer is in the company's uh, policy and procedure. So that's that's where it's, it needs to be clearly stated uh, who has who has rights and responsibilities on on what occasions uh, testing can be done, what happens if a person refuses, all, all that needs to be spelled out in the procedure, and the procedure needs to be uh, created um, in consultation with workers, with unions, and especially with with medical people who who understand I, I guess what. A, uh, a non-negative test means for a particular drug versus another one. So uh, it can be quite complicated, but the but the answer has to be in the the policy and the procedure that's uh, documented and well communicated across the work site. And and I guess the um, I guess the reason they have to do it 
uh, or they're required to do it is their duty of care in, uh, under a legal framework because if the if an incident happens and the uh, a, um, it got investigated and found that um, uh, drug and alcohol use was somewhat reasonably known in the workplace but but the employer had done nothing about it um, then they um, they can be held responsible in a, in a court of law for for not putting a system in place in the first place. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, a question has come in regarding, I guess, in, in regards to the industries that you did mention. Um, question is, why is the health industry any less at risk than any industry? Um, you are responsible for people, not just inanimate objects. The health industry. Sorry, can, can you just run that by me again, please? Yes. So the the, um, the question or the comment is, why is the health industry any less at risk than industry? You are responsible for people, not just inanimate objects. Oh, okay. I'm with you now. So, in other words, the health industry doesn't appear to have... I haven't mentioned them in my list of industries, and that's because I haven't actually seen uh, the health industry uh, have these pol policies in place, but that's just me. Um, the other part of your question I'm, I'm hearing is um, why shouldn't they have one in? Well, no, I agree with you. And um, and if the, uh, the uh, health and safety committee, the safety officers, the the managers in the health industry, um, if they have a look at their risks and um, and have a look at potential consequences, um, they may well decide to have similar policies as well. So effectively, you know, I agree. And the basis of it is, you know, do the risk assessment. What's the possible outcome of um, uh, inappropriate behaviour, incorrect decisions being made, and hence what can be done to uh, reduce that possibility? And certainly, uh, education, um, testing, um, uh, certainly are, are all ways that a a, um, a responsible company in 2015 can um, can implement to um, provide a, um, a reasonably practicable uh, lowered level of risk. So, so good question. Thanks Gary. Um, just in this question refers to I guess the list of alcohol and drugs that um, that you referred to. Um, the, the questions I guess asking why tobacco wasn't on the list. Ah, tobacco. So you're you're quickly getting me into perhaps an area that I'm not qualified in. I can only I can only guess that tobacco doesn't have the short term effects that the the, the drugs have that are on my list. Um, certainly, tobacco has um, many long term effects. Um, but I stand to be corrected on that. I'm, I'm not. I'm certainly not a doctor. But that, that's my my uh, estimate of why uh, tobacco isn't on the list. Thanks, Gary. Uh, another question: Can a company self-manage random testing, or does it uh, have to be undertaken by an external party? Hmm. Uh, once again, I, I think you're catching me out on my thorough knowledge of this topic. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think my honest answer is I'm not sure. It's just wiser to be to have it by an independent party, so so there's no um, corruption, so to speak, in the process. Um, but I've not. I've not read or seen anything where it has to be external. I think it's just wiser to have it that way. All right, thanks, Gary. Um, question, unions are resisting the introduction of random testing um, in, in our industry, which is local government. Do you have any suggestions for addressing this level of resistance? Hmm. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? Unions. Um, I guess the. Um, I guess my my strategy would be unions listen to their rank and file people, um, continue with the education program. 
continuing educating people the possible the the possible effects the likely effects um, uh, using use examples from um, similar industry perhaps um, if there's known in incidents from uh, drug or alcohol related uh, or associated with incidents uh, use that uh, I'd, I'd go down the education path and um, apart from directly talking with the unions but but also you know continue um, talking to their members and use HSRs if you've got HSRs um, in your system that that are trained in in risk assessing incident uh, investigations um, that that uh, the um, the link between uh, the workers and management um, um, use them as, as part of your uh, communication process Thank you, Gary. Um, and just reminding people, there is still time to submit uh, questions before the end of uh, this afternoon's webinar. Another question that's come through, we have a drug and alcohol policy for random testing, but we do not say what happens if a person refuses to attend the tester. Does that mean they can refuse without consequence? So, uh, it may... So first of all, the it's I would say from experience it's very unwise to have no consequences, but it all needs to be spelled out in the procedure. So um, yes, I would say it's very unwise not to have consequences. Thank you, Gary. Another question from your experience within industry: What would you advise as tol as tolerance level of alcohol allowed, for example, zero tolerance? Mm, I, I, I have to admit that this one's out of my area of expertise. Uh, this is back to medical people explaining what the, um, I guess, what the effect is of, of different levels and, um, you know, the percent that's found in the, in the blood and, I, I guess, taken on a, a risk, a risk approach um, to the um, to develop the procedure would be my advice. All right, thank you, Gary. Uh, another question that uh, that's come in: How do I know how my workplace will handle personal medical information? Mm, good question. Um, so once again, it depends on the company policy and procedure. So the the, the policy and procedure is the first step to um, ensuring that personal uh, medical information is kept confidential um, and generally it's uh, that information would go to the the supervisor and, and the works doctor um, would the uh, is my is my experience as to how far that information is um, is distributed but and maybe even the uh, the supervisor would be uh, get access to a limited amount of that information, but that's uh, an example of what needs to be in the company procedure and policy. Okay, thanks. Um, another question that's uh, that's come in: um, Overseas immigrants or, or migrants um, appear uh, to treat or use drugs uh, differently, um, or possibly more regularly. Um, how how would you approach uh, that situation? Yes, so this is, um, I guess, a, a more and more uh, relevant question in today's society when we're getting people from uh, Syria. I'm not suggesting I know, know anything about uh, people's history of taking drugs in, in Syria, but um, but certainly immigrants. So, um, so once again, it's the it's the um, systems that we've got in place for work health and safety, so that there's the uh, the selection system in the process of uh, in the, in the for the process of selecting people, the recruitment process, um, checking whether they're actually fit for work. Uh, then there's the induction process. So once people have, have passed the uh, in, uh, recruitment process, uh, there's the the induction and the training system where the um, I guess expectations and requirements on people. Uh, are clearly explained and discussed, and and then you've got the ongoing uh, supervision, performance management uh, by supervisors uh, and managers. That um, is the, I guess the the ongoing uh, system that's required to 
or that we're relying on to, um, uh, I guess, explain ultimately the systems uh, we need to explain to the people um, and, and link, link the possible effects to uh, work health and safety incidents in the workplace and the, uh, the effect on both them and their, their, their workmates. Thank you, Gary. Uh, a question, can you um, um, give us the, the difference or, or, the, compar or the, the differences between, I guess, um, saliva testing and, uh, and urine testing? Yeah, so the, um, as, as I understand it, there's a, there's a, a bit of debate um, in, the, uh, um, in the workplace, so to speak, as to uh, uh, which, which tests are, are better or should be used. Um, once again, it's a, it's a little bit out of my um, realm of expertise, but certainly saliva is less invasive. Um, but urine testing is, um, is likely to be, um, uh, have less less false positives if you if you if you take my so it's I describe it as being more accurate but I'm told the the correct terminology is is less likely to be false positives and it's also the urine testing is cheaper but having said that technology is constantly improving and there's um, constantly better tests being um, uh, uh, developed uh, designed uh, um, so that um, uh, invasiveness and uh, false positives are, uh, will become less and less a problem as uh, better tests come in. All right, and just a last last couple of questions. Can a policy have two tolerance levels? For example, manufacturing zero tolerance, um, and for example, admin 0.05. Would that be seen as fair? Well, I guess I've got to go back to the to the risk assessment, um, getting the medical the medical advice as to um, the effects of um, 0.05. Was it was that the yes the level given, Steph? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. I'd I'd go back to the the risk assessment. What are possible outcomes of uh, 0.05 versus z uh, zero? Um, Hence, and then what are the, in terms of outcomes, in terms of uh, effects of uh, behaviour, uh, decision making, etc. And then um, what are the uh, effects, what are the possible effects in the environment? And I guess that's the basis of the question. And, and this is where some companies want to do as much as they possibly can to reduce uh, the likelihood of incidents. Hence they go for the zero tolerance. Um, and um, um, yeah, as opposed to other companies that perhaps take a, um, a little bit, um, go to a, a different standard. But um, that would be the, um, the reasoning, risk assessment, and then um, where does the company want to be in terms of being a leader in, in, in tolerance on these levels? All right, and final question uh, for this afternoon. What are suitable consequences for employees who have non-negative results? Suitable consequences. So what I've seen, so I'm, I don't classify myself as an expert here, but um, I've certainly seen a, a suitable consequence is um, uh, having a, an, an approved or, or sort of a, um, a discussion about, you know, how did they get into that circumstance, um, getting on to a, a suitable program. It really, it really depends on, I guess, the, um, the person's um, willingness to be open and honest about how they've ended up in that circumstance. But, but certainly um, um, not coming back to work until there's a, there's a suitable uh, follow-up program in general terms is what I've seen.
And thank you very much, uh, Gary, for this afternoon's presentation, Work-Related Alcohol and Drug Use, a Fit for Work Issue. And thank you as well to everyone for attending uh, this afternoon's webinar. Again, if you do have any further questions, you're uh, more than welcome to uh, contact IPM Safety for any further information. And also, once you do leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. So again, we sorry <laughs> do appreciate you completing that uh, survey and providing us with your feedback and your comments. And again, we do have webinars running again tomorrow during WorkSafe Month, and the month finishes on the 30th of October. So do head to the WorkSafe Tasmania website, have a look at the program of events, and do register for further activities that we do have coming up. So, on behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania and our presenter today, Gary Lebson from IPM Safety, thank you for joining us and have a great uh, rest of the day and I hope it's a, a safe and healthy one. Thank you and thanks Gary.